I'm with artist, New York artist, Ellie Yaw, who is the current artist in residence at the Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft. Welcome. Um, and if you would uh, uh, explain ex exactly your experience on uh, the Tara. Mm. Well, I was invited um, to be on the Tara um, as the only artist in residence of this boat. It's a very special boat. It's made of aluminum, so it was able to withstand the, the pressure of the ice. So it was actually the only the second time in history this had been done, the well, second time that we know of where a boat was built purposefully built to be stuck in the ice. And the idea was that the um, boat's built like an olive pit, you know, so that the slopes, the side slope, and when the ice um, squeezes it, it pops up, as opposed to being squ squashed. So if you see like the, you know, the Shackleton, the famous endurance expedition, you see this massive wood and boat, but it doesn't matter, because it's just the way the hull's constructed, it you know, completely collapsed. So, so basically the tower was drifting for a year and a half, um, and it started in eastern Siberia, and it was just drifting with the um, frozen ice, but underneath the ice is still the ocean, so it has a fairly predictable current. And I was invited on, and it ended up being the last half year of the expedition, the last winter, although of course we didn't know it at the time, because the idea is that we were always getting weather predictions, but a lot of times those were wrong, because it's still almost impossible to make long-term weather predictions, you know. And so, um, sometimes they think, okay, you can be out in two weeks, you can be out in a month, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. And this, I thought, was really the characteristic of our time there, for me at least. Because we knew we were getting close. We were, you know, we had, the boat had already kind of gone over the pole, more or less. It didn't quite hit 90 degrees. But it was, it was clear that this was the last rotation of crew. And so I came on in um, late September, so just as the sun was setting. And I, yes, so I'm the only artist on board, and well, what does an artist do, you know? And, um, I was first and foremost crew, because it was a, you know, it was survival. We had to cut ice for drinking water. Mm. I had to assist, you know, obviously the scientists with their work, um, the ice corings and the snow pits. And, and then the morning and the night was when I would try to work. Um, and I became very interested in this idea of, of future talent. You know, we think we have agency in the world, you know, to go yet left or right, go out the street, and, but actually, in the Arctic, you feel that agency is completely gone, even though we never have that agency to begin with. So, you know, the ice was constantly changing, especially the closer you get to the ice edge, which in the winter is about 80 degrees, yeah, by 80 mm. degrees north. It's not like one day you're just out of the ice. It's kind of a couple of months of back and forth, so maybe one day is slush, mm. and then the next day it's completely a frozen desert again. And this kind of fluctuation between land and sea, you know, because we're in between states of matter almost, um, made it a little, our, I think the psychology a little more tenuous, as it, um, much more tenuous than say you were just sailing, because you knew you were always in the sea. Because we treated the ice like a land. You know, that's where all our equipment was, that's where our toilets were. And um, so I became interested in these different forms of telling the future. And of course, we were also there to tell the future, in a way, for global warming. And the beginning of my project was called The Fortune Tellers, which was a, a series of performances um, that mixed the banality of life in the Arctic with kind of the more metaphorical thinking about um, how, um, the, for example, the plankton, which is one of the few forms of life in the winter, besides mm -hmm. us and the polar bear, how the plankton, in a way, parallels our existence because the plankton can only drift, it can't choose where to go. Mm -hmm. So in a way, kind of linking the small ideas and the big ideas of the everyday life with the more, you know, uh, poetic thinking. It's kind of, in a way, the, a very loose description of my project when I was there. Although I didn't, you know, know I was going, what project I would do. You know, it kind of came as I went. Yeah. And can you briefly describe your performance here at KMAC? Yeah. So the performance I'll be doing here is called Reading the Decatara. And Reading the Decatara has, in a way, its point of departure, the tarot card. So I, I made a, a deck of cards. Um, every card has a different photograph on it. Um, and every card has a name and a, and a metaphor it represents. So I sit at the table, um, and the person sits across from me. And we deal five cards. There's always a center card. And that's the card stays focused, and then the other cards change every time. 
depending on how many readings you sit with me for. And whatever cards come up, um, the stories change. And in a way, I started this project to help me write. Because you know, you find that you start to remember things in a very predictable pattern. And I realized I had thousands of images, but I only really kind of focused on a few, and I wasn't wasn't happy with how I was writing mm -hmm. when I was writing for the fortune tellers, these other performances. So I had given a friend of mine um, about I don't know, 200 images, and I said, pick 52, you know, cover that. And whatever images she picked, I printed out, I made you know, handmade cards, and I started to kind of use those to write, uh, and kind of deal out for myself, say 10 at a time, or however I would do the spread, so to speak. And it kind of helped me make connections that I hadn't been making before. And then I would ask someone to pick a new deck. And so I kind of did this as really as a private tool mm -hmm. for a while. And then I became interested in, in making more spontaneous stories. So the Fortune Tellers as a piece is quite fixed. It's a monologue in a way. It's a script. Um, the images, you know, there's a flexibility to it, but it's not spontaneous in a way. Um, whereas this is always different. You know, you can sit there a hundred readings and it'll, you know, some themes will keep coming up, mm -hmm. but it really depends on which cards are next to each other. Love to draw, so to speak. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and tell us what you're you're currently working on, or that um, you're in the middle of right now, and uh, what we can expect from Elia. Yeah. So I um, kind of, in a way, the project now it kind of starts and ends at the North Pole. But um, when we got out of the ice, the first light we could see wouldn't be the sun, but the light of the lighthouse, and became really interested in why the word in, in the Romance languages, because this was a French expedition, why this word, le far, le far, or why this word is so similar to many languages. I mean, we don't have this lighthouse is from German. Um, we don't have this mm -hmm. connection. And, and through research, I realized um, that you know, it comes from the great lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the ancient wonders of the world, which was on Pharaoh's Island, um, which gave the lighthouse its name. Mm -hmm. So it kind of went through Greek and then to Latin and then to the Romance languages. And in the 90s, well, I should backtrack and say that the lighthouse went down a series of earthquakes um, in the modern era. So outside the pyramids was the only um, uh, ancient wonder to last until the modern era. And so in the 90s, archaeologists started to seriously work on retrieving the stones and sculptures from the lighthouse which lie up on the bottom of the sea mm -hmm. um, around the harbor. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite that deep, it's about six meters. Um, so I was really interested in this idea of following this light, mm -hmm. the first light you see after these months of darkness, oh, yeah. following it in a way to the bottom of the sea, so in a way the project starts walking on the frozen sea, and then, I don't know if it ends, but then it continues underwater. Mm -hmm. And so for the, last, for the spring of this year, I was studying in Alexandria, I was taking um, classes at the University of Alexandria's marine archaeology department. And, and it helped me meet a lot of the archaeologists who, who helped make these discoveries um, or contribute to the studying of these discoveries. Because, you know, always this question of who really has discovered it. I mean, I think in, in terms of local people knew about this for hundreds mm -hmm. and years ago. And, and then I was also diving in the harbor and seeing what was left over because the archaeologists definitely lifted up you know, the more exciting pieces, but you can still kind of piece together the stones down there. And so I'll introduce a little bit of that material here because with the Decatara, I start to extend the metaphors to Alexandria. So, you know, we start in the Arctic with the cards and then we end underwater. So we'll have a little um, a bit of that material here and again it helps me kind of develop uh, the performances and and then, yeah, I'm just being writing and, and I'm trying to make a new project based on, on the lighthouse. Well, we can't wait to see it, yeah, so I'm sure. excited to see this. Um, once again, this is Ellie Gall at the Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft, and she is one of the artists that is part of the new exhibition, Storytelling as Craft, that opens on September 7th. Thank you.